we at? Where are we at in the course is that we've, um, we spent all this time talking about how to do transactions. We spent all this time how to actually build indexes. And so now we're going to sort of the bottom of the storage layer and talk about how we're actually going to store data. Uh, no longer are these, are these abstract tuples, just these things we point to in our indexes. Let's actually talk about how we're going to actually lay out the bits of these things. Um, and then going forward for the next couple uh, lectures will be, again, how to make storage even better. Um, and then we'll have spring break, and after spring break, then we'll focus on, for the, for the most of the rest of the, the semester, on how to actually execute queries. Right, again, because these are all the different pieces of the systems you need. All right, so just as a reminder, I showed this uh, chart or diagram in the very beginning of, of the semester. Right, this is what we're looking at in, in, uh, in memory database. We have an index. It has pointers, which are going to be block IDs and offsets, that then point to some, uh, some tuple within the offset of a block and the fixed length data blocks. Right, for this one, I'm showing this as a row store. The idea still applies if it's a column store. And then if you have any attributes that are larger than 64 bits you don't, and, or variable length, you don't want to store them in line in the fixed length data blocks. You just have a 64-bit pointer to some offset within a variable length data block. Right? So we'll explain why, you know, part of today is we'll explain why we have to do this, why we want to do this. Actually, it's the next slide. So, all right. So the way to essentially think at a high level what an in-memory database actually is it's just a bunch of arrays of bytes, right? It's just this giant byte buffer. And so what we're going to do in our system is that we're going to look at the schema that was got, got defined for our tables when you call create table, and we're going to use that information to figure out when we jump to an offset, like say we're following the pointer, we jump to a tuple offset, we then know how to interpret the bytes that we're looking at at that offset. And the schema is going to tell us this. So at the very lowest level, when we allocate memory for our, our database, we're just malloking a big byte array. But then we're going to impose structure on top of that as defined in, in, in our catalogs that we're storing when we create tables. So that's essentially what, what, we're, what we're focusing on today, or what those bytes actually look like. So obviously, every tuple is going to, has, has, a, has a header in front of it. Um, and this is going to store all that metadata that we talked about for MVCC, like begin timestamp and end timestamps. Uh, and then we'll see some things later, later, later today. We can put more things like keep track of whether what attributes are null and other things like that. So the reason why we want to store uh, most of our data, the tuples, in these fixed length uh, data blocks is that it's going to make it super easy for us to figure out where one tuple stops and one tuple begins. Right? We know exactly the length of every single tuple. So if we're back here, when we have this block ID, Right? That gives us the pointer to maybe the starting location of this block. And then the offset is, will be things like, you want the fourth tuple, you want the sixth tuple, something like that. And you know with the length of every single tuple inside, this is the same, because these are all fixed length attributes. So I just do a simple arithmetic to say, I want the sixth tuple times 100 bytes, and that's, that's where I jump to my offset to find that. So again, what we're essentially just doing is just taking these large byte buffers we allocate with, with malloc from the OS, and we use our schema to then uh, put structure on top of them and allow us to manipulate them as, as needed. So for today's agenda, uh, we're going to sort of talk at the lowest level of how do we actually represent uh, the individual types in, in, in a tuple. Um, and then we'll go a little bit bigger, and well, we have to worry about how we actually want to lay out these, these, this data, make sure we're word aligned. And then we'll talk about how to actually now take either uh, multiple attributes from, from, from the same tuple or multiple attributes, or the same attribute from multiple tuples, and we can store them as a row store and a column store. So we're starting at how do we deal with a single attribute, and then we'll get bigger and bigger and look at maybe storing multiple tuples and then maybe uh, multiple blocks of tuples. And then we'll finish up hopefully with time and sort of explain uh, an aspect of database systems that I, I find super fascinating, um, which are system catalogs. And we'll just do sort of quick high level what, what, it actually, uh, what they actually are. I actually want to do a whole lecture on system catalogs, but there's no p good paper on this when we're trying to write that now. So eventually we will have this. All right, so let's jump into this. So the way the database system is going to represent the single attribute values for, for our tuples is going to be either a combination of what the Harvard is going to do for us or some kind of higher level user space code that we're going to write. So at the lowest level, you think of like integers. So these are like the basic types you would get in the SQL standard. So 
ends, big ends, small ends, tiny ends. The same way that the, the, that the, the operating system or the hardware is going to represent these different types when we allocate a variable in C, it's the same thing we're going to store in, in our database system. Because right? this, is, this is actually defined with the, by the hardware itself. Because right? there's going to be instructions that know how to do uh, operations on uh, you know, integers with, with different sizes. For, uh, for, for floating point numbers or decimal numbers, uh, we're going to have this distinction between, again, what the hardware is going to provide for us, floats and reels, so 32 and 64-bit uh, uh, reels. And these are going to be defined what's called the 754, or IEEE 754 standard. Again, this is a, a universal standard that says, here's how to actually represent these kind of values in, in hardware. Um, but there are also, we could have fixed point decimals, like numerics and decimals, um, where this is all going to be inside of our database system. We have to write code to actually handle these. And then for timestamps, dates, and date times, and, and other, these sort of you know, time types, the various systems will do different things. All right, sometimes the time and date and timestamps are just all uh, synonyms for each other, and underneath the covers are stored exactly the same, either 32 or 64-bit integers. Uh, all, most of the modern systems are all based on the number of milliseconds or microseconds or regular seconds since the UNIF epoch, right, which is like January 1st, 1970. The older systems from like the 1980s, or the things that run on Windows, obviously don't do that. Um, so they had their own internal representation for doing this, or maybe just use what the operating system uses. Um, sometimes in some systems, like you can say date without time, and then it can store that as a, as a, you know, a, a smaller size. But again, for simplicity, a lot of systems just, just use the same thing. And, just ex and then when you access it through SQL, they allow you to have different properties on them. And then for var chart, var binary, and text blobs, again, if the, if the, if the value is less than six, is less than 64 bits, we actually can just store it in, in line with the fixed length tuple, or the fixed length data. But if it's larger than 64 bits, then we just have a pointer to some location in the variable length memory pool. And at that, at that pointer, you'll land, there'll be a header and there'll be a, uh, that says, here's the length of the data you're about to read, and maybe a pointer to the, the next piece if it's broken up across multiple chunks. Again, I'll, I'll, I'll show a diagram uh, what this looks like. So the thing I want to focus on is this, uh, the decimal sorts of reals. So as I said, you can either have floating point numbers or fixed point numbers. And the floating point numbers are actually what you get from the hardware, again, as defined by the IEEE 754 standard. Right? And these are going to be faster than the fixed point numbers because the hardware is going to have instructions to take either 32-bit or 64-bit floating point numbers and do whatever arithmetic you want to do on them very quickly, right? And the standard specifies how do you handle overflows or how do you handle you know, rounding issues and things like that, right? Because we can't store exact values uh, with these basic types. So to show you exactly what, what, this, you know, what this looks like, uh, so this is a really simple C program. I want to declare two floating point uh, variables, 0 0.1 and 0 0.2. And in the first case, I'm just going to add them together and see what the output looks like. And then here, if I take 0 0.3, which I know should be the answer, and just print that out with a, a lot of leading decimals. So when you run this on x86, you see that the, the, neither one of these gives you the exact value you'd expect. Right? Neither one of these are a 0 0.3. Right? This one is 0 0.3 followed by a bunch of stuff. And this one's 2.9 followed by a bunch of stuff. Again, because the way we're representing floating point numbers in the hardware itself is can't be at you know 100% precise, so that's why you're going to have these issues. Now, obviously, if you say give me just the, if you just say give me the the only the one one significant digit, you would get 0 0.3 and 0 0.3. But underneath the covers, right, it's actually it's rep, the bits are represented like this. So if I actually do say is this equal to this, you would come up with negative, right? So the, in a, a lot of database applications, especially when you're dealing with money. Uh, or you know, with things that have value, where you don't want to have these kind of rounding errors, you have to switch and use the fixed precision numbers or the fixed point decimal numbers, right? And so sometimes you can clear these as numeric, sometimes other systems call them decimals, right? And again, the way to think about what's going to happen is that the database system is going to store the exact value as almost like a, a, as a string, like the exact decimal. And then it's going to maintain some extra metadata to say, 
here's what the decimal point is, here's what the, uh, you know, here's what the variance is, or the, 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 what, whether I'm signed or unsigned, all the extra things you need to have to guarantee that these are fixed points. But the issue is going to be, this is going to be way more expensive to, to use, or these kind of values, because it's, you know, the hardware can't do this natively for us. We have to write this code in ourselves, right? So I always like to give this demo just give you, to show you how bad things actually get. They're not, they're not bad, but like the, the performance difference actually is. Um, so I'm going to run this in, uh, can everyone see that? So it's we Postgres at the top, MySQL, and then this is actually SQL Server running on Linux. So the, what I did was I generated a, uh, with a simple Python script, we generated a CSV file. Let me log in, sorry. So I generated this like really simple CSV file. Can you see that? Yeah, over here. Let me close this. Right, it's just uh, a bunch of random uh, decimal numbers, right? And there's two, there's two of them, right? They're per per row. And then in the database, um, go up here. Select star from. So there's like, I think there's 10 million of them, right? And it's just a two column table. So what I did was I, I created two tables. I'll do this in Postgres, drop table, test reels. Where one is that it's gonna be decimals and one's gonna be with reels. And then I, I, and I'm loading the, the CSV file in. So let me create the two tables. So the first one is with reels, right? And the second one is with decimals. And then I can load in both of them in, from the, the CSV file with a simple, with, with the copy command. Should, shouldn't take too long. Um, right, so that one's loaded. And then it, again, so you do copy and then it tells you how many it loaded, right? So I wanna see how the query I'm gonna run is gonna be to scan every single row and add A and B together. So the query is super simple. It looks like this. <coughs> and I'm going to comp compute the sum of them. All right, so this is going to look at every single row and take A plus B and then compute the aggregation of them. Okay? So I want to show you that it's more computation expensive to use the fixed point precision numbers instead of the floating point precision numbers. So to make sure that I there's no interference of like reading things from disk. Uh, I'm gonna use this nice Postgres extension called pgwarm, which basically goes and gets uh, every single uh, page for these two tables and brings it into the buffer pool. So now everything's in memory. Now I still have to go do buffer pool lookups, and we talked about how to set latches and to go do that, right? That, that doesn't go away, but now the, you know, at no point are any of these queries gonna solve because of disk. The other thing I want to do also too, because it's Postgres uh, 10, I want to turn off parallel workers. Okay? All right, so the first query will do this with, uh, with decimals. So, this is, so here's the query we're going to run. We're going to put explain in front of it, followed by analyze and buffers. So explain what basically does normally without any of these extra flags is returns back the query plan that the, the optimizer generates without ex executing the query. But if I put analyze, it says, Give me the query plan, but also run the query. So you can actually figure out how long it takes. And then buffers, well, it's, it's a Postgres thing that'll say uh, what percentage of the data you had to read came from memory from, from the buffer pool versus came from disk. And in, in theory, this, you know, everything should be in memory. All right, so the qu first query runs, right? And dirty, don't want to stop with that. Uh, that's weird. Um, whatever, so that's, that's one of my pages we had to read. Uh, and then the time it took was up there, 28.58. So it took uh, 2.8 2, 2, 2. seconds, right? So that's it with, with decimals. We'll run the same query with um, reels and see now it took uh, 1.2 seconds, right? So the with decimals was twice as slow as with real numbers. 
right? Because we're going to be doing extra work to make sure, again, that we're taking fixed point numbers and, and getting exact results. So let's see the same thing in MySQL. I've already loaded the data, so we don't need to run it again or load that again. All right. This may actually be reading from disk. Yeah, 3.74 seconds. Let's do it again and see that the time is correct. All right, 3.6 seconds. And then we'll run it on reels. 2.3 seconds. So first of all, in this case here, Postgres is faster than MySQL. Uh, <laughs> but again, the, the, the reels took uh, one second, the real was one second faster than, than the decimal one. All right, the last one, I just got it working this morning, will be with uh, SQL Server. Same thing, same data set, loaded in. Um, so let's do decimals first. Uh, you can't see the time, you gotta j jump out of it. All right, so it took 1.1 1, 1 1 second, and then reels, 0 0.6 seconds, right? So SQL Server is faster than all of them, right? Because SQL Server is actually really good. Uh, but again, the decimal version was twice as slow as oh, it, uh, than the real one, right? Right. So this sounds like you would always want to use the reals, right? Not the decimals because it's faster. But no, because I showed you before that you have rounding problems, right? So we actually can see. Uh, let's go back and use Postgres, right? So let's just actually get what the answer is. So here's it is with reals, right? One point something with, and then in scientific notation, here is it with decimals, right? One with a bunch of other stuff. So let's actually go see if we can take the real one, we can cast this as decimal. So this allows us to read it more clearly. All right, so I rounded it up, right? So but clearly you can see at the very top, it's one point and then five zero seven three six, and this is like one zero one, right? Clearly they're different numbers, right? Because the real one is, is, is not gonna be 100% accurate because the harbor is gonna do rounding stuff. Whereas with decimals, because we're controlling exactly the calculations we're doing when we do the summation or the addition of the two values, then we, then we get a precise result. So again, if you have money, you don't want this because you lose stuff. You always wanna use the top one, okay? All right, so we can go real quickly and actually see what Postgres is actually doing. So this is actually this is actually a, the struct from Postgres's impl implementation of numerics, right? And you see that there's a bunch of stuff in here, right? And this is again, this is the extra data they're maintaining per value in, in a tuple, right? So it's not if, if I'm storing, you know, a, a, well, what could have been a 32-bit integer, or sorry, 32-bit real stored in my system. Now I have four 32-bit integers, and then this thing's basically, again, the, the var chart, right? This is, a, this is a type def to up here. This is where they're actually storing the string of, of the actual decimal itself. And then when you, again, you look at the code of Postgres, uh, here's the addition, right? Here's how to take two numerics and add them together. And you see there's a bunch of you gotta deal with for like overflow, or if one is negative, one is positive, uh, if one's null, right? This is just, again, we have to run this code to take A plus B, in my example, and, and then do it 10 million times. Right, these, these are clearly gonna be way more instructions than the single, a, you, know, you know, two numbers plus together that we can do in the hardware. So I think numerics, so numerics you have to have, uh, but the idea is that for as much as possible, uh, for all other data types, we wanna use the CPU instructions. Right, so we don't want our own exotic integers, Oracle does something like this. Uh, we want the hardware to do everything. But for, for, for fixed point decimals, we have to do it ourselves. So this actually, I think, uh, this would actually be a very interesting project for someone to do in, uh, for, you know, for the class project at the end. Actually add support for numerics and actually make this, make it work really efficient, as, as efficient as possible and be able to do like vectorized execution on it, which I'll explain what that is later. But basically use special CPU instructions to do this uh, in batches. So I'll, I'll talk about that later. All right, so we now know how to, we wanna store our individual bytes for our attributes. But now we gotta worry about how we're actually gonna lay them out and put them next to each other. So 
again, think of a tuple as just a byte array, you know, char array. And so the, when we have our schema here, the, the size or the attributes that we're defining here specify how much space they're going to occupy in that byte array. Right, again, we always have our header. This one's kind of small, but like, you know, because again, when we talk to MVCC, we were storing like 64-bit timestamps and things like that, right? So this, this it's gonna be, the header will be much, much bigger than this. But we have our 32-bit integer, and then, we and then we have our value, right, which is a 64-bit integer. So if I want to access this thing here, I, if, I say, if I go through my index, my index is going to give me a block ID and an offset. Now I'm going to land at some location uh, where the block header is. I do math to say, well, I know the size of my every single tuple is the header size plus 32 bits plus 64 bits. Multiply that by my offset. Now I can jump to this location here. I want to access the first attribute. I know my header is, say, 32 bits, so I know how to jump into to here to get the single attribute that I want for this tuple. So now the code, you got to be able to access, you want to do something with this, right? You want to treat it as a 32-bit <coughs> integer. But as I said, we're just storing everything as giant byte arrays, char stars. So in the code, we would use reinterpret cast uh, to take whatever address that we're pointing to here and tell the compiler that we want to treat it as a 32-bit as a integer. And then now whatever code is on the other side of this can access it as if it was a 32-bit integer. So reinterpret cast is, is a compiler instruction. It's not something we're doing at runtime. All right, it's just saying, you're just telling the compiler that I'm going to read this address and treat it as, in this case, a, a you know, assigned 32 bit integer uh, pointer. All right? So for variable length blocks, uh, again, we don't want to store this in line because again, in order to do that nice, you know, nice and easy math to jump to offsets and, 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 and tuple locations, we don't want to store anything at uh, you know, the variable length. Everything always has to be fixed, fixed length. Um, so in this case here, say we have uh, our, a single attribute for our tuple. It's a varchar 1024. So this is just, when we jump to this thing here, we would know that this is always going to be a 64-bit pointer that will then point to some blocks in the variable length, variable length data blocks. So this could either be uh, a single chunk or we could break up to multiple chunks. And the way you handle multiple chunks is this, you have a, a, a pointer here in the, in the header to say, here's all the, you know, if you want more data for the rest of this value, here's the location in the, you know, another location in the variable length data pool. And whether this is 32, 32 bits or 64 bits or even something even smaller depends on whether this other chunk is going to be guaranteed to be in the same variable length, length, length data block, right? So for simplicity, if you just always make this 64 bits, then you don't care where the second thing gets moved around, right? If you make it something smaller, then you have to make sure that this guy's always in the same block or chunk, or sorry, the same block as, as the other one. So as we're scanning along now and, and so maybe doing, doing a, a where clause and, and examining, you know, does my string, you know, is, is my var char equal to this? Or is, does my var char start with this, this, you know, this byte sequence or string sequence? Um, we had that same issue we saw last class when we talked about B plus trees, where say we want to do, you know, as we're scanning along, and we want to do a quick evaluation to see whether our tuple matches our predicate or a key matches our predicate, we would always have to follow this pointer to land here and then, and then read the first couple bytes just to do, you know, to do, execute our, our predicate. So for some systems, actually, what they do is they increase the size of the, the variable length data pointer Right, the double the size, you can do 128 bits. And then they have just a prefix of, of the first couple characters in the, that's in, down here in the variable length data pool in front of the pointer, right? or at, at the back of it. doesn't matter. All right, so now when I'm scanning along and I want to say, does something equal something, and I'm looking for where, you know, where value equals x, y, z, I can do a quick comparison here say, well, does XYZ equal Andy? No, and now, now I don't even have to follow that pointer. So as far as I know, for in-memory databases, Hyper is the only one that does this. Um, you don't see this in the disk-based database systems because they always store the variable length, length data, for the most part, always in the same block and the same slotted page as, as the rest of the tuple, right? Yeah, so this is, I should have said at the beginning. In a disk-based database system, the tuple 
all the, the, the fisc length and the variable length data is usually always stored together in the same page. In the me main memory databases, in memory databases, we store them separately. So to avoid having to follow this pointer, we can put the prefix there. Okay. So now we know how to store variable length data. We know how to store uh, fixed length data, whether, you know, whether it's based on hardware or, or it's something in user space. The next thing we need to handle is actually how do we store nulls. So there's three ways to do this, as far as I know. So the first way to do this is that in the domain of whatever the value type you ha you're defining, you just have a special value represent null. Right? So say if you're doing 32-bit integers in 32, right? if you go and look in limits.h in libc, they'll define the min and max values. So you could make the min value, the minimum value you could have for a sine 32-bit integer defined by this, this, this pound define. You just have that represent null. Right? So the nice thing about this is that you don't have to store any extra space to keep track of whether an attribute is null or not, which you have to do in these other two here. Um, you only kind of lose one, you know, you lose one value in domain. Uh, is, you know, there's one less possible value you could store for a 32 bit integer because of this. Um, the, this is the way we did it in HStore, and then, then the way that VoltDB does it, as far as I know, still does it this way. Uh, MonadB, MonadB does this as well. Um, you don't really see it that often because there's a bunch of extra you have to write in the, uh, in the sort of the, the layers above the storage manager to make sure that nobody tries to actually insert a value with you know, n32 min, because they may think they're storing that, that actual real value in, but then when they go to, to read it back, they're, they're going to get back null in SQL, which is not what, what they would expect. Right? So you have to add extra code to make sure that nobody actually tries to insert this thing and you throw an error and say it's out of bounds. And then you also have to handle overflow to make sure that like, if someone takes this value and subtracts it by one, you know, do you do wraparounds or not? Because you don't, you don't want to land on this thing because it could magically go to null. Um, what is the most common approach is actually to store a separate uh, bitmap to keep track of for every single tuple what, what columns in that tuple are null, right? So basically, you think of this in the header of every single tuple. If I have 10 columns, I have a bitmap of 10 positions or 10 bits. And then if the bit is set to null at one offset, that tells you whether the column at a particular offset in the tuple is set to null. So pretty much everyone does it this way. Right? All the disk-based systems do it this way. Oracle, Postgres, MySQL, SQL Server, everyone. Um, this is the way Hyper does it. This is the way we do it now. In the old system in Peloton, we did it this way because we you know, inherited a lot of design from HDR VoltDB. In the newer system, we do it this way because this actually gets faster. This is faster when you're doing um, uh, scans now uh, over, over large, large segments on columns. Because you can just look through this thing, figure out what's null, and then go on, and then read the actual uh, the actual values. Right, so if you're looking for something equals something, I can do a quick vectorized lookup on this thing, which I'll explain what vectorized lookup means later on. But like, I can do a very efficient lookup in a, in a over across a lot of tuples in this bitmap, find the ones that aren't null, and then go do the lookup on the actual data. So the, the downside of this one is you're actually storing uh, you're actually storing you know, obviously more data, right? It's an extra bit per attribute per tuple that could be null, which isn't that bad, right? Because if you think of like the MVCC stuff, we're storing you know two 64-bit timestamps per tuple, so this thing is not that big of a deal. The last option, which is way less or way less common, but you still could do, is instead of storing a single bitmap with flags per tuple for all the different columns they have, you just store a, f a separate flag per attribute to say whether it's null or not. Right? So you can see I store my attribute and then I prefix it with a, well, with a little flag in front of it to say whether it's, it's null or not. So the tricky thing about this though is that you just can't store an extra bit in, some of the, in front of the attribute. Right? So if I have a 32-bit integer, I can't, use, can't make it a 33-bit integer and just put a single bit in front of it. Right? We'll explain why that, that up in a second, but to give an example of what you have to do to pad this out, 
Um, this is actually a screenshot from the doc mutation of MemSQL. This is from version 6. I should have checked whether it's still, uh, whether they, they still do this. Um, MemSQL is the only system that I actually know does it this, this third way. Uh, but the thing I want to point out is here, so they had the different data types, you know, that's part of the SQL standard, but they have two columns for what the size actually will be. So you have the size when it won't be null and the size when it could be null. So then the size when it won't be null, it's exactly what you'd expect it to be. So like just looking at integers here. So you have a one byte integer, tiny end, two bytes, three bytes, four bytes, eight bytes, right? 32 bit integer, four bytes, 64 bit integer, eight bytes. But when, these, when, the, when the column could be null, the size they have to store is, is almost, in some cases, double, right? So to store a 32 bit integer that could be null, you have to store it in 64 bits. And take a guess why you have to do this. I already sort of said why before. <clears throat> yeah, but yeah, but why why is this like why are they storing eight bytes instead of like five bytes? Because the alignment of memory affects how quickly you load it. Yeah, so he said exactly what we're gonna talk about next. Because the alignment of memory of this data, again, think of just it's just a byte array. The alignment of memory for these attributes will affect the, the, the performance of the system when you actually load it in, right? Right. So this is I already said it here, right? Because this is all going to mess up with word alignment. So here, here, who here knows what word alignment is? Okay, perfect. So maybe like eighty percent. Okay. So uh, let me say real quickly about this. Um, right for this one, no, MemSQL is the only one that does this. Uh, I think it's a bad idea, but whatever. Uh, a couple systems do this. This is the one that's most common. All right, and this bitmap takes space. Uh, I, I just wanted to mention too, like sometimes you see some systems have limitations on the number of columns you can have per table. Like in Postgres and SQL Server, it's like two to the sixteen, right? They it's that number for a reason because that's how they want to allocate these these bitmaps. Um, Oracle is a thousand columns per table. There's no real reason they did it that way. It used to be 100 in the 1980s, and then some dude changed it to 1,000, had to fix a bunch of stuff, and then they told me that like it's just too much to change, so it's 1,000, right? Uh, for our system, we, you know, we obviously want to not have those artificial limits. All right, so let's talk about word alignment, or why, why this is problematic, and why they had to pad it out. So what I'm about to describe to you uh, is not 100% correct, because I'm going to describe this in terms of 64-bit uh, words. Right, we're going to worry about alignment across 64 bits. In actuality, in the hardware, we're going to care about 64 bytes, which is the cache line, or 16 bytes, which is the, the, the word size of, of x86. So I'm going to show you this idea in the, con in the context of 64 bits, because it'll fit on my slide. But in the real system, it's actually much larger. Okay? But the basic idea is the same. So again, we, our tuple is just a, a, a byte array. right? But we can divide this byte now up into words. And so when we start storing the, the attributes for a tuple, what could happen is the, the, those, those attributes could span these word boundaries. Right? So say I want to store this table here. I have four columns. I have a 32-bit integer ID. Well, that fits 32 bits nicely in here. Again, I'm, I'm ignoring the header for now. Right? The header would be you know, over here. I have a 32-bit integer. My timestamp is going to be 64 bits. I have a 16 bits for my char and then a 32 bits for my integer. Right? So in this case here, say I will now want to do a lookup on the, the creation date. Right? I do my, do my arithmetic to figure out, uh, here's my offset for my tuple. Then I look at my schema, which is stored in my catalog, and says, all right, I want, this, the, the, customer, I want the creation date timestamp. What columns exist before me? Well, I have the 32 bit uh, ID here. So I know that when I want to jump to this address to get this data, I'm jumping 32 bits over, right? But of course, now what's the problem? The creation date spans two word boundaries. So what would happen if I do a lookup on this? Well, it depends, right? Three things. So the first, first thing that the hardware could do for us is that it could be nice and, and do the extra reads across those two words Stitch the data you want back together, and then hand it back to you nicely in, 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 a, in a single in cache lines as a you know single contiguous piece, right? The other approach is that it could be undefined behavior, 
and it just reads whatever. Maybe it reads the first 32 bits or, and then gives you that, or maybe it reads the second 32 bits because it, it, it was only trying to do one, one word access, one word read, right? It just gives you some random stuff and it's up to you to figure out whether you know, this is correct or not. The last approach could be just they reject it and say you're trying to do un one unaligned word access and trying to read two words in a sing single member location uh, and it just says I'm not going to do this and throws an error. And it's up to you to fix your code to make sure that you're reading aligned data. So x86 and the more recent versions of ARM will do this for you, right? Because again, x86 goes out of its way to make your life easier as a programmer, right? It keeps everything cache coherent, make sure that if you read, you know, doing reads across boundaries, it'll put stitch them together for you, right? You don't have to worry about these things in your application, right? In terms of correctness, you'll get the correct data, it just might be slow. So when we're building our, our in-memory database, we want to avoid having to do those extra reads. The hardware will do it for us, but we know it's going to suck, and we want to avoid it as much as possible. Right? This is what ARM used to do in the past, right? Because again, like it's it's technically still correct. Your program won't have incorrect results. It may fail, but it failed because you wrote it incorrectly. But the newer versions of ARM will, will, will do this one. And this is like old exotic hardware. I, 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 our embedded devices will do stuff like this. We're, we don't worry about here. So what's one obvious way we can fix this? Yes, padding, exactly, yes. You know this because you did it, right? <laughs> so what we could just do is when we define our, you know, we define our schema, again, we're a relational database. So we're told this, we had this already. Like, you know, the, the schemaless databases in the world, they had to figure this out on the fly because the schema might change per, per record. In a relational database, we have this information ahead of time so we can prepare accordingly. And we say, well, we know we have 64 bit words, and the first attribute we're storing is 32 bits. The second attribute can't fit in the remaining 32 bits. So we'll just pad it out with a bunch of zeros or garbage. Right? And then our next, next attribute starts, that fits in a single, single word. And then our second attribute starts, and then those two guys fit in a single word. And we pad it out so the next tuple starts at the beginning of a word. Right? Now to do that single lookup on, on the creation date, I just jump to this one location and it's one word access, one, one read in, into memory, and the hardware is happy with us, and that runs efficiently. So if you run perf, perf, one of the events you can get is unaligned memory access. Right? It'll tell you how many times you're doing unal unaligned lookups. Right? You can, and if you're trying to figure out why your program is slow, you know, that's a good tool to figure that out. Like call grind's not going to give you that because it doesn't know anything about what, what the hardware is actually doing because it's, it's a lower low level hardware performance counter. All right, so padding's one approach, and again, in the execution engine we built above this, we would be aware of this padding so we know how to jump accordingly to find the data we want. What's another alternative? Yes, in the back. Uh, I guess you can reorder the attributes and then put all three bits together to have one more. Beautiful. Yes. Okay. So he said you can reorder things. So. In this case here, I, the, the, the zip code, that was the, the last attribute, but now I moved it into this attribute here to be physically next to the ID field, because now these two guys fit into a single 64-bit word, right? Again, the beauty of the relational model is that we have the separation between the logical definition of what our table looks like and the physical representation. So the application just said, hey, create table, give me these four attributes, right? And it defined them in these orders. But we said, F you, we're gonna go reorder your thing to put this guy over here because we know that's gonna run faster for us, right? Now in this case here, uh, and for this example, I ran out of, you know, there, if there was more attributes, we could fill that over here. But, you know, so technically from, from padding to this one, we took the same amount of space. Uh, if we had more attributes, we could maybe pack them in there. But again, we always wanna make sure that the next tuple starts at the, the right boundary, right? So, and again, the upper level parts of the system will know how this thing's actually physically laid out and can, can read it accordingly, right? So you'll see things like, um, again, the, in the relational model, the order of the tuples themselves, right, because it's, it's bag algebra, the tuples as you insert them are unordered. So you're, you're not guaranteed to get back, if I insert tuple one, tuple two, tuple three in that order, when I do a select star and get back all those tuples, I'm not guaranteed to get those things in that order, right? Because it can insert them in any way that it wants. I actually don't know whether relational algebra specifies that you have to get back 
tuples or sorry columns in that same order. I don't think it does. But as far as I know, most systems, even if they reorder these things, will give you back the results in the order that you specified here. Because I feel like that would throw people for a loop, right? Um, and a lot of times people write shit code where they like it's, you know, instead of actually accessing the, the you know, you get back a result set, instead of accessing the column based on the name, you access, access it by the offset that you define it when you call create table. So the point I'm trying to make is we, even though in theory, I think the theory says we can give these back in any order, we'll always re reorder them to put them back in the order you specified in create table. So when we were building our, system, our new, new storage manager for the system, our new system this summer, uh, we had to do this. We actually had to go and make sure that everything was actually word aligned. So to give you an idea of actually the performance difference you can get, uh, so this is a simple micro benchmark that one of the students here ran from the summer uh, and Wayne was, was helping with this project. So this is the very first uh, benchmark we did without doing any alignment. And so I'm measuring here, so this, this, this workload is just trying to insert tuples as fast as possible. So the, 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 the performance metric is the, the amount of data we're, we're inserting per second, right? How many megabytes per second? So without any alignment, we're getting like 500 kilobytes per second, right? And then we did two rounds of optimizations. I think the first one might have been padding, and the second one was reordering plus padding. I don't remember exactly. But we're going from 500 kilobytes a second to 800 megabytes per second by just reordering the attributes as we stored them, right? So alignment makes a big, big, big difference. And every in-memory database will do this. So the way we do it is, it's almost think of like a bin packing problem. You try to figure out how to reorder the, the attributes to, to, to take the least amount of data while also making sure everything's still aligned, All right? Okay, so any questions about layout or type representation? So let's now jump into the storage model stuff. So again, we, now we know how to store single, single attributes for a, within a tuple, and now we know we want to lay out the, the memory contiguously so that we're word aligned. So now let's talk about how we actually want to represent multiple tuples. So we can either store these in a row-oriented row format where it's all the attributes for a single tuple together, or in a column-oriented format. So I'll describe, I'll discuss these two first, and then I want to talk about uh, some approaches that have been tried to, that, that have been people pursued to try to get the best of both worlds of both these guys. So this is called what a, a hybrid storage model. So as a spoiler, I say this is what Peloton used to do in our old system. We threw that, all that away, and now we only we're only a column store. And I'll explain why in a second. So the paper I had you guys read is a bit old, uh, but I like it because it really lays out. Uh, you know, it gets to the core differences of row stores versus column stores. Now, it wasn't in the context of an in-memory database, which is fine, uh, but the, the basic ideas are still very sound. Um, I really like this paper a lot. Uh, Dana Boddy is, uh, he won the best dissertation award for SIGMOD on column store databases. Uh, the, he's now faculty at, um, at University of Maryland. I love this paper. Again, it's really easy to read and, and describes all the core issues that we care about. My biggest problem, though, is the title. The fact that they put the word really on a line by itself, right? <laughs> they should have put the new line after the colon and then had how are they different together, right? But whatever. It's a great paper beside that. All right, so the NRE storage model or the, 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 the row store or row oriented storage model is what people normally think of when you think of a database. Like when we taught the intro class, or you t see when people describe databases, they're almost always describing the NSM uh, storage scheme. And the basic idea is that the, all the attributes for a single tuple are going to be stored contiguously with each, uh, with each other. So my tuple begins, and then I have my, all my various columns, and I don't start the next tuple until I go through, you know, I store all my data. Now I may have pointers to the variable length data stuff that's sort of separate, but within the fixed length data, I represent all my columns, right? So we talked about the difference between OLAP and OLTP in the beginning. The, the row storage model is, is ideal for OLTP workloads or transactional workloads because it, these kind of queries are going to be accessing a small number of tuples, and they usually want the, all the attributes. So when I do a lookup and say, you know, get Andy's tuple, I say I'm logging into Amazon or whatever, I, it's, a, it's a single uh, jump into memory at an offset to find the starting lo location of my tuple, 
and then I just read across every single uh, column all together. That made all may all fit in a single cache line. Uh, the other aspect of this, we're not going to talk about this just now. We'll talk about this later in the semester when we talk about query processing. But the, typically, the way people uh, execute queries and process data using a row storage model is, is, is tuple at a time. Right, because in L2 workloads, I only care about getting a single tuple or a small number of tuples. I'm not doing large scans over an entire table segment. So the way you can actually store a, uh, a row storage model is e using heap organized tables. And this is essentially what we've been talking about so far, these fixed length data blocks, right, where we're storing uh, you know, large chunks of memory and just all the tuples are contiguous. Um, you can also store them as index organized tables, and this is where the the leaf nodes themselves in a B plus tree or a skip list, whatever, whatever you're, you're, you're storing your database as, that's where you actually store the tuples themselves. But you're still going to store them as, as in, in row, storage, row storage manner. Right? So this is what MySQL does. This is what MemSQL does. Or if you get the row store in MemSQL. Right? It, I'm not saying one is better than another. These are just two different ways to organize things. And it, again, depends on the workload. So. The advantages of NSM is that they're going to be fast for inserts, updates, and deletes because it's going to a single memory location and getting all the data for a single tuple. Um, and you can use this index or index storage is in a way you can't really do with a, with a column store. Now, it's not good for OLAP is because when we want to start scanning large segments of the table, in analytical queries, you're not going looking at every single attribute in, in a tuple. Right? So we're an in-memory database. We're not worried about disk reads anymore. But still, as I start scanning along, I'm going to be within a single cache line fill. I'm going to, because you know, I have to do my lookup to get to the tuple before I can read it. That cache line fill is going to bring in a bunch of crap I don't care about. So maybe I'm, I'm just doing a computation on a single attribute. My cache line fill is going to bring all the attributes in for that tuple. And so that's wasted space. So the same idea, we want to reduce the amount of disk I.O., we want to reduce the number of memory, memory fetches. And so we can't do that uh, in, a, in a row store if we're doing analytical queries. So this is where the column store stuff is, uh, is better for, um, because I'm going to organize all the attributes for a, all the data for a single attribute across all tuples contiguously in memory. Now I still have to worry about layout, right? I still have to make sure everything's word aligned. But now within a, 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 a you know, stride of memory or block of memory, I'm just going to have all values for one attribute. So now if I'm scanning and doing a lookup and it's just looking at one attribute, it's one jump to memory to start to find the starting location and I just rip right across and I'm only reading data, I'm only fetching data from memory and putting it into my caches for data that belongs to my query. So again, we'll talk about different query processing models, but you can use the vectorized execution model or, query, or vector at a time model that's better for column stores with, with this approach here. Again, I'll explain what that is later. So for the, the background for column stores, it sort of seems obvious now uh, that you, you'd want to do, you know, organize your data this way for, for analytical queries. Um, but it, you know, it's, it's only actually in the last 20 years, was it 2019? 15 years that people recognize column stores are, are the way to go, right? Like it's again, some of you are like 20 something years old, so it's you know when you were in kindergarten. But you gotta understand, back in like the, in the in the in the early 2000s, column stores weren't really a thing. Now they're everywhere, but back then it was like it was it was unheard of. So the very first column store goes back to the 1970s. This thing called Cantor. Uh, it was actually from the, the Swedish military, some prototype system they had for processing data. So it wasn't really a full database system um, that we think about today. Like it didn't support SQL. It was, that, it was like almost like a file processing, a batch processing system. But it organized the data as columns because it recognized that if you're doing analytical queries or doing analytical operations, going through single columns at a time instead of having to look at the entire tuple is much faster. In the 1980s, there was a paper, uh, sort of the first known paper of proposing what the decomposition storage model or the column store storage model was, came out. In the 1990s, the, now we see the first sort of commercial system that was a column store. So there was this thing called Sybase IQ. It wasn't a standalone database system. It was actually like a query accelerator, an in-memory query cache you could buy for Sybase. So you would have your regular Sybase row store system, and then you could buy this thing and put it in front of it to try to accelerate 
uh, you know, analytical queries. And this is what was called fractured mirrors, which we'll, we'll, I'll describe in a second. Again, in the 2000s is when the column store stuff uh, became in a vogue. Vertica was the commercial system, the commercial implementation of C store, which was in the paper you guys read. Vectorwise was the sort of better version of MoneyDB, which we'll, we'll cover this later. And MoneyDB is like this academic system that is actually pretty good that came out of uh, CWI in Europe. So these are sort of the first sort of specialized column store systems. And then everyone recognized column stores are the way to go. And then so in, in our decade, every single major database vendor has a column store add-on. And then there's a bunch of standalone systems that are entirely based on, uh, on column store or column-oriented architecture. Right? If you're building an OLAP system now today, whether it's in memory or on disk, and you're not a column store, it's, you're, you're not a contender. It's stupid. Right? You would not do this. All right, so the one thing we need to worry about, though, is how can we find our tuples in our column store? So in the row store case, when I did my lookup of my index, I got back what? A block ID and an offset. So then I knew how to jump to find the starting location of that tuple, and all of the attributes were stored contiguously. right? But now in a, um, in a column store, the starting location for the different columns are in different regions of memory. So we need a way to figure out uh, maybe as we're scanning along or as we jump around to try to find individual tuples, because we still want to support that. How can we go maybe reconstruct the tuple and put it back together? So the two approaches are to either store fixed, just use fixed length offsets or to actually embed the IDs. So obviously, as I said, I've already sort of spoiled this before, fixed length offsets are the way to go. So this is the way everyone does it. Um, in the paper you guys read, they said this is what Oracle does, which is the system X thing. That's, you, know, you can't use Oracle by name. That's called system X, but it's Oracle. Um, the reason why I know this is because the third author is uh, this guy, Nabil, was, a, was an Oracle DBA in Boston that they would always hire to help them with papers. Um, so what they would actually do, so the way Oracle would do vertical partitioning, not the way that Oracle does real column store, which we'll see in a second, the way they would do vertical partitioning to approximate column stores was they would actually prefix the, the, the tuple identifier in front of the value itself. So if I had a 32-bit 32 32 -bit identifier to say, you know, here's tuples. This this attribute for column A is for tuple zero. This attribute for A is, is for tuple one. Right? I'm storing that over and over again for every single column. The better way to go, as we already said, is to do fixed length offsets because now, as I'm scanning it through, I know what the starting lo memory location of this is. I know where what position I'm in. I know the size of every single value because it's fixed length, and then it's simple math to figure out what my offset is. So now if, I, if I'm at this tuple here, I'm at, I'm at tuple two in column B, and I want to get to tuple two in column C, I just do simple math to jump down here. Right? In the back, yes? Um, when you have the null object with the big map. Say it again, when you what, sorry? When you have like a null uh, attribute with the big map that we talked about before. Yes. Where is that big map stored in the column? Right, so this question is when you have a, uh, if you're using the second approach to store nulls, which is the, the null bitmap, but now I'm using a column store, where do I store the, that bitmap? You treat it as a separate column that's stored in the same block as these guys here. Again, same thing. It's, it's fixed length, because it's one bit. So I, I know how to immediately jump to any offset. That make sense? OK. All right, so in the paper you guys read, they talk about a bunch of, bunch of extra stuff about query processing, which we're not going to cover here. Uh, we talk, they talk about light materialization. Uh, columnar compression, which will be the next lecture, and then vectorize or block-based query processing or processing models. Again, the first and second one we will cover when we talk about query execution, and this one we'll cover next class. Right? The main takeaway here is that the strategies you're going to use to store data, uh, actually compress data, and actually run queries on uh, column store data will be much uh, uh, dramatically different than how you would do it from a row store. And these strategies are allow you to take advantage of the fact that you're storing things as a column store. All right, again, we'll cover compression next class, and then these things, these, the first and third one we'll cover when we talk about um, query processing. Again, part of the reason I had you guys read that paper, because again, I think it, although it covers a bunch of stuff that we're not going to cover in this lecture, I think it lays out the difference between the two of them quite clearly. And I like it a lot. All right, so again, what are the advantages or disadvantages of the column store over the row store? So, the key one that we care about is we're going to reduce the amount of wasted work we have to do because we're only going to read data that we actually care about for our query. 
right? So going back here, I have, I have four columns. If my query only needs to access two of them, like B and C, I don't worry about A and D. I never even read them. I don't pollute my cache. I don't spend my time crunching on them, right? I can do that easily because we're a column store. Next class, we'll see how we get better compression. But the main way to think about this is now all the data storing in a single column is going to be uh, quite similar to each other. I have a zip code column. There's only 35,000 zip codes in the United States. So I know that every single tuple, every single value within that column is going to be one of 35,000. Right? Not, you know, not, you know, not, you know, zero to infinity or zero to, to two to the 32. So there's a bunch of compression techniques I can use to take advantage of that. Now the downside is going to be that because the data is going to be decomposed across these different columns for a single tuple, in theory it's going to be slower for, well, I mean it is, but I would say, the reason I'm saying in theory because it's maybe not as bad as I originally thought it was, but it'll be slower for point queries, inserts and updates, and any LLTP things because if I need to stitch the tuple back together, let's just, you know, it's a select star where I want all the attributes, I got to do separate memory fetches to find the tuples that I want and put it back together. Or if I'm doing an insert, I got to take my tuple, break it apart, and then sort it in separate columns. Right? Whereas in, in the, the row store case, I jump to mem one memory location, I do a single mem copy. Right? All right, so let's talk about the motivation for hybrid storage. So again, we're, when we talk about the HTAP systems, the idea is that we want to be able to run transactions and analytics on the same database instance. So we have our transactions coming in, they're updating the database, and then we want to, do, we want to analyze that data as we ingest it and extrapolate new, new information. So the common access pattern you see in these type of applications is that data is usually hot when it first gets entered the system, and hot means that it's, it's more likely to be accessed again in a transaction in the, in the near future. Right? So it, data is, is, is more hot when it first gets entered, but then over time it cools off, and you're less likely to update it, but you're still going to want to access it through an analytical query. So the I, basic idea here is that if you can recognize when data gets hot, when data's hot and when it's cold, then you maybe want to store the hot data as a row store, because that'll be faster for the transactions, because you want, you, you know, those are super latent, latency sensitive, so you want to run those as fast as possible. But then over time, if it cools off, then you convert it to a column store, because then that'll be faster for when you run analytics on it. Right? So this is essentially what the hybrid storage model is trying to do. You're trying to get the best of both worlds. You're trying to get new data into the system as fast as possible, storing it as a row store, and then you want to get taken advantage of compression and faster query execution for the colder data by turning it into a column store, right? So there's, a, there's two basic approaches to do this, right? Now we're actually talking about the actual implementation. So the first is that in the system itself, you, may, you have two separate execution engines, one for row store data, one for column store data. And then when queries show up, you try to figure out you know, whether it needs to run on one side versus the other, right? One execution engine will control data in, in, that's in a row store, and the other execution engine will control data as a column store. Now, from the outside, from the application standpoint, it looks like a single database instance. You don't know that it has these two separate engines, right? You just, you know, you have a connection, you throw SQL queries at it. And then there's this little middleware piece in front of it that says, all right, well, this is an OLAP query. You go here. You're an OLTB query. You're, doing, you're updating something. You go over here. And I'll show different ways to do that next. The other approach is, again, what we did in Peloton, but threw away, is to have a single architecture that can handle both these operations on the same sort of data set. So a single code base, single execution engine that can, do, that can do both of them. So for the separate execution engines, at a high level, one way you could think about this is that you essentially have two different database systems running simultaneously in the same database, or the same system, right? So, Again, from the outside world, it looks like a single logical database, but underneath the covers, it actually could, could be storing things uh, quite differently. And then anytime you have a query that has to span uh, the, the both, both of these two engines, you need some kind of mechanism or coordinator above it to make sure that uh, everything is synchronized. All right, for select queries, it's easy. Like you run one query here, run one query there, and then you stitch it together to produce a final result. If you're doing updates, you may have to update both sides, and you have to use something like two-phase commit to make sure that everyone is, is in sync. So there's two different ways to do this. 
Uh, the first is called fractured mirrors, which I talked about in this, uh, before. Um, and this is what, if you buy the column store accelerators from Oracle and IBM, Oracle, I think it's called in-memory column store. Um, for IBM, they call it uh, DB2 Blue, BLU. Um, these use the fractured mirror approach. And then SAP HANA uses the delta store approach, which will look, you know, it'll, it'll look like the time travel tables from MVCC. All right, so fractured mirrors, the basic idea is that we're going to store a second copy of entire copy of the database uh, in a in, in a the, the, the column store layout um, and anytime that there's an update from the, the the row store side we have to propagate it to the column store side so think of like Oracle right so if you download you give Oracle money or whatever uh, the Oracle by default the, the original Oracle is a row store right it's an NSM so that's the, the primary copy of the database but then and all your transactions go here and update things. Then there's this background process that recognizes, all right, I'm making changes here, and then applies these changes to a column store copy that's in memory. Right? So now if any analytical query comes along, it can recognize, oh, I can run that on my column store. I had the data you're looking for over here, and it runs the analytical queries on this, this copy here. Right? And it's much faster because one, it's in memory, but two, also because it's a column store. So in the case of, uh, for Oracle, actually, I don't know what IBM does, but in Oracle, this thing is ephemeral or transient, meaning if the system crashes, this thing gets blown away and you just rebuild it when you come back up, right? And they have a way to invalidate things, like if, they, if, if, uh, if I do an update here for a single tuple, I, can, I make sure that this thing doesn't, I, I, I remove it here before any analytical query tries to touch it. And again, if they have an analytical query that maybe wants to span data, uh, or maybe let's look at the entire database and you haven't propagated all the changes from here to here yet, then it knows how to, again, get some data over here and then uh, merge it or coalesce it with the data from, from the results you, you've collected over here. This is very expensive. Uh, I don't know how much it costs, but there's, there's a reason why he has his, his own super right? Um, all right, so the other approach is uh, Delta Store. And Instead of having the column store side be a copy of the row store side, you have the column store side actually to be where you store all your cold data. So again, there's this background process where you're going to take data that's, in, 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 that's stored in the, in, the, in the row store side. At some point, it's cold. You say, I'm not going to update it anymore. And then you migrate it over here. So when you, when you bring it over here, it is no longer in, in this side here. right? So any transaction still always goes into this thing. So again, think of like the time travel table from SAP HANA. They sort of had two separate tables. One had older versions, one had the latest version, right? You can think of this as like always the newest version for MVCC, and this is always the oldest version. But when you, when you create the old version, you convert it to a, a column store. It's not exactly how they work, but the high level is the same thing. So this is not also, this is, what I'm describing here is also not specific to in-memory databases, right? So in the, in the fractured mirrors, that was a, a, a the mirror was uh, in memory. The, 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 the primary side was in disk. For this one here, uh, HANA is entirely in memory. So both sides are in memory. But Vertica does this as well. Vertica is a disk-based system. So this, Vertica, this is all disk. And then this is backed by disk because you have to log it. But this, is, this hangs out in memory. And again, you have some mechanism to be able to run queries on both sides and, and coalesce the results. All right, uh, I'm going to jump through this really quickly. Um, we will cover this later on when we talk about larger than memory uh, databases. But basically, there's a bunch of stuff you have to do to figure out what's cold. Right? The easiest thing to do is have the DBA tell us. MemSQL does this. So for MemSQL, if you want to go from the row store to the column store, the DBA, they're, they're completely separate tables, and the DBA has to pull data, data out from one and put it to the other. Um, there's mechanisms to basically track the, the user's patterns of, 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 of queries on tuples. And you can either compute this offline or online. Again, we'll cover this, uh, I think, in two weeks, the mechanisms to do this. But again, this thing on MVCC, we're already keeping track of timestamps when, when tuples are accessed uh, or modified. We can use that to figure out uh, what, what's cold and what's hot. So let me tell you what we used to do to say why it sucks. Uh, but that's, it is what it is. So what we used to do was that we said that you actually don't want to maintain two separate execution engines that you want a single engine that's flexible enough to be able to operate on both row store and column store data all together within the single query. I didn't care about what, what layout actually was. 
Right, so in the case of like the fraction mirrors from Oracle or IBM, those are actually two separate engines running. They had to combine the results. In the case of SAP HANA, there are also two engines as well, because they, in, at least in the original version, they bought a bunch of database companies, put them together as this Frankenstein monster, and they called it HANA. Right? It was like it was like T-Rex, P-Time, MaxDB, all together, and they did two-phase commits to, to keep them in sync. The newer version doesn't do that, but the old version did. So we argue that the better way to do this is have a single single engine that can handle both of them. So what we would do is that we would have a mechanism that would recognize that here's how queries are accessing data, right? Here's what columns you care about. Here's the hot data. Here's the cold data. And then we would store the hot data as, as a row store, and the cold data we break up break it up as a column store. And again, this is all transparent to you as the user, right? You just define your table. You don't you don't specify whether you want things as a row store or as a column store. Uh, what portions of the data we did this for you automatically, right? So the 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 way we would do this is that if you, if you look at the old documentation of Peloton, or we'll end up reading I think some Pel Peloton papers, we talked about this thing having this tile architecture. And the idea was that we would have these different tile groups within a single uh, within a single table, and think of these as like blocks for the table. So one block tile group A would store things as a row store, and another block would store things as as a column store. And these, in this case here, these two attributes were used together often, so we we would combine them together. And then what would happen is when we do queries to do execution lookup, we would have this additional header column that would tell us. What kind of what is the layout for every single column that we're looking at? So then, when we executed queries, uh, it would get back this like result set, which would end up just being pointers now into offsets within these columns. So we could pass this result set, this vector of of offsets, up into di to different parts of the engine, and then it then would do the translation to figure out the data you want at this offset, since it's the tile group is laid out this way, is at this memory location. So we again, the, this was all sort of abstracted away from the actual code that processed queries. We had a sort of indirection layer that could do this mapping for us, right? So I will show you a graph uh, here that shows that actually does work. Um, so for this one, we're running a, a workload that's uh, a, it's sort of this dinoral pattern of scans followed by inserts. So you sort of think of like your business. You insert a bunch of data during the day, like, you, like you're a trading company on the stock market. Uh, nine, to five, nine to four, you're trading, so you're doing a lot of inserts. Then at night, you're doing risk analysis, or you're doing a bunch of scans. So we have scans, insert, scan, insert, right? It's back and forth. So in the uh, row store case, the inserts are fast, the scans are slower. In the column store case, the scans are faster, but the inserts are slower. And the idea with the, the, the hybrid layout, the adaptive layout in Peloton is that Everything always started off as a row store, but then as we saw a bunch of scans on it, we would recognize that you're trying to do scans on this data. You're not updating it, so therefore we should we convert it to a column store. And then over time, that made the uh, that made the scans get faster. And then for our inserts, we always inserted things as, as a row store, so we got the same speed as as the pure row store. But then when we did again the scans, we would do in this case we were doing better than the column store because we could actually store some tuples that were always used together. You know, in in, a, in aligned together in in a single uh, you know two column group, and that improved cache locality, and that's why we, we're doing better here. Right. So I saw this graph. I'm like, this is great. We want to do this. Turns out it was actually a pain to maintain and implement. Um, every student that came along that worked on the system, we like, what, what the pile stuff? They couldn't figure it out. Uh, so we decided to abandon it. And in the system you guys are working on now. We're actually a pure column store. And the justification is that in the old version of Peloton, we were actually doing a penned, uh, penned delta version storage in MVCC. So every single, single time you updated the tuple, you would, you would create, a new, you know, create a new version, a complete copy of that tuple. So in that case, uh, you know, you're, when you're doing scans, you're scanning over a bunch of stuff that you actually don't need because it's not visible to you, right? And so making things a column store sort of helped improve that. The, we now are a pure column store with delta versioning. In that case, it, the, you can think of the delta versions as almost the same thing as a row store. Like if I do an update, I'm doing, you know, I still have to split my, my, my update up into, um, into the different columns, but I'm only updating the fields that I modify. 
right? So if I have a thousand columns, I only update two of them, I'm just doing two memory writes. In the old Peloton code, because we were pen storage, it would be, you have to write out every, all 1,000 columns because you're making a complete another copy of the tuple. So there's some other tricks we can do to speed up, uh, uh, we think we can do to speed up the, uh, the version chain operations for transactions in, in the newer system, but we're already much faster than what the old system could do, so I don't care, right? So I think a well-written column store with delta versioning is the right way to go, and you don't have to do this. And from a code, from a software engineering standpoint, this is, this is, this is much more, way, way more simple, right? Actually, going back here, looking at this, this indirection layer, it's a nice abstraction, but we pay a penalty for this, right? Because now we have to follow these pointers and do additional lookups, whereas now in the, in the current code, we do know how to jump right to memory to get the data that we need, okay? All right, so I have like five minutes. I want to teach you guys catalogs in five minutes, okay? Again, I could do a whole course on this, or sorry, a whole lecture on this, but there's no paper for you to read, so this is like, this is the quickest brain dump I can think of. All right, so almost every single data system that's out there stores the system catalogs in tables themselves, right? So you sort of eat your own dog food. So the system catalogs are where you store metadata about the database. So you keep track of all the columns you have, all the tables you have, all the attributes, everything, right? So the issue now is the, when you actually want to use this internally inside your system, Right? You're storing a bunch of things as, as tables. You don't want to have to like, do lookups in, into the catalogs, catalog tables running SQL queries, because that would be super slow. Right? Think of this. I have a select statement, select star from table foo. I need to do a lookup in the catalog to figure out where, what the string foo maps to, what, what, where, where in memory is this thing actually being stored. I don't have to do another, memory, you know, another lookup within a SQL query into the catalog to figure out where that thing is. So you have sort of an abstraction layer on top of this that allow you to manipulate the catalogs sort of directly. Now you sort of think it's, uh, it's like an object-oriented interface to catalog tuples themselves, right? So bootstrapping the catalogs is a bit tricky, right? You need to have a mechanism that, again, doesn't rely on SQL to, to install a bunch of stuff about, like, here's, you know, here's my database, here's my, my usernames that I, I need to have in order to turn that thing on. Right, so most systems, every system that, that stores the catalogs in the tables themselves have to have a separate uh, you know, initialization function that does this. And the way Postgres does it is that they generate macros from the actual code itself, and then they have an interpreter for these macros that then reads it and then populates the catalog, which I think is a nice way to do this. So what's really awesome about this, and I haven't tested the commercial systems, my SQL and Postgres don't do this 100%, is that if you make, if, you, if all your catalogs now sort as tables, and you're gonna manipulate those tables with transactions, now your catalogs become transactional. And this actually makes your life way easier to do a bunch of stuff. Um, like when you start making changes to your database, like I wanna add a column, if that's done in the context of a the transaction, then, then under snapshot isolation, no, no query that's running before can ever actually see that column even though it's physically stored there. So you don't need extra protection mechanisms to make sure that nobody reads data from the tables that, that shouldn't be, they shouldn't be reading uh, if you always go through your catalogs and your catalogs are following the, the, the semantics of serializability or, or snaps of isolation. So when we want to do schema changes, uh, there's actually a difference now when, of how hard it actually is when you have a row store versus a column store. So to add a column, uh, in a column store is super easy because I don't care about all the other columns. I just create a new column segment, poof, I'm done. Then I update some catalog information to say, if you want this column, here's the offset to it. In the row store case, you gotta scan every single tuple, add in the new, and you know, copy it with the new column in it, and at some point invalidate the old one. So it's almost like a select followed by a delete, or it's actually basically an update where you're doing a, actually a physical change. So there are tricks you can do to do this lazily. Like if you have a default value, uh, then maybe you don't actually update uh, tuples that already exist. Any new tuple that gets added has the default value in it, or it would have the new column in it. And then if you read any old value, you just you read it as the default because it's not set yet. Like there's optimizations like that you can do to speed this up, but for the column store, it's super easy. Same thing, drop column. Uh, if it's a if it's a row store, you just blow away that, that column, and who cares? It's gone. 
Uh, and obviously you need to do this with, under, with, the, with the garbage collector to make sure you're not doing this when any active transaction is reading it. Right? Again, if everything is running under MVCC, this is super easy to do. For drop column, you could copy tuples into a new region the same way you did add column. The alternative is actually you just mark the column as, as deprecated, and then at some point, any new, any new, new tuple would not have the column. Any old tuple gets garbage collected. You go ahead and remove it. So this is essentially this is what Postgres does, and I think other systems do, do this one. Change column depends on the change you're making, right? If it's a, say you're changing something from a 32 bit integer to a 64 bit integer, well, that means you need more memory and you have to, you know, reallocate the space and, and copy things over. But maybe if you're going from 32 bit to 16 bit, maybe you just leave the old 32 bit numbers there and just, it's sort of wasted space for now. Indexes are, are, are still really tricky, uh, even with transactions. So, there's a bunch of different ways to do this in a non-blocking manner. Like the easiest way to build an index is you lock the table, make sure no transactions are touching it, no other transactions are running, do a you know, complete sequential scan and then populate the index and then un un unlock it. You obviously don't want to do that because it'll be slow and block transactions. So there's a bunch of techniques where you can do this in an in a, in a, in a online fashion or in a concurrent fashion. Uh, Postgres, MySQL, and Oracle all do different things. But the basic idea is that maybe you scan through the table, populate your index, but then you keep track of any changes that transactions are making to that table as you're running. So then at some point after you build the index, you go back and, and fix it up based on the changes that you missed. Right? That's the, that's the, at a high level, that's, that's what you do. Drop index, all you have to do is just logically drop the index from the catalog. Right? That means basically deleting the entry in the catalog table. And then it's gone. No other query that comes after you, after you commit, can ever see it again. And then at some point, the garbage collector says, well, I know there's no query touching my, this index. So it's safe for me to go ahead and, and, and remove it. Right? You have to make sure that you actually also invalidate any query plans to make sure that no, you know, no cache query plan can, can go still look up on it. So catalogs are super interesting. We're in the process of actually still building this in our system now. Uh, we, you know, we, we decided not to use any of the old Peloton code because it was kind of hacky the way we were doing catalogs. We were still in the tables, but it wasn't 100% the way I wanted. So we're still working on the new version now, but a bunch of these schema changes things are actually super interesting, super complicated. Uh, it would actually make a great project uh, for the class as well. All right, the last thing I want to talk about is sequences, which I also find super fascinating. Um, so sequences are like the auto increment numbers. If you're familiar with MySQL or like Postgres serials, like you can define a column to have this auto increment number. So every single time you insert a new, new tuple, it increments this counter by one. And it guarantees that you always get a unique number, right? So what's super fascinating about sequences is that although we're going to store them in the, in the catalog with all of our other metadata about the database, they don't actually have the exact same transactional semantics you would expect of regular tuples. And this is because these, these sequences always need to be marching forward in time. Like, oh, sorry, always be, always be incrementing. And I never want to roll back even though the transaction that may have incremented that counter had failed. Right? So let me give a quick demo, and I realize we're out of time, but let's do this. Mm -hmm. So we're going to do this in Postgres. Postgres is at the top. Let me kill these other ones, sorry. Okay. So what we're going to do is we're going to create a table that has one key. Let me kill this too, sorry. All right, we have, we have a table, XXX, it has one, one attribute, all right, and we're using serial. So serial is a, uh, a, a shortcut in Postgres to be able to say, this thing is an auto increment column, create a sequence for it, and then set the, uh, set the default value for this table, for that column, to be the sequence. Right, so this is this is getting the description from the catalog about what this column the table looks like. Right, so I have here my ID column, and it says the default value is the invocation of this function here. So next val is to increment to, to increment and get the, the next value for a sequence, and then it automatically fills in the the sequence that it created for me. XXX is the table, ID is the column, and then sequence is, is that. Right. So I can have a function now that. I have this next val function here, right? When I invoke that, 
uh, it, get, it gets the next value and then increments it, right? So I do this again, I'll get two, I do it again, I get three, right? So now if I go to my table, if I insert into, uh, into the table, and for this one, I'll do insert, and then I set the, the value to be default. That just tells it to use whatever the default value is as defined in the catalog. And I do a commit. And I do a select star from the table. I, will, I should get, I think, the value is 3, because that was where I left the sequence all, or 4, right? If I insert another tuple, it'll have, uh, it'll have 5, right? So again, it's updating this in the catalog. We have to store it out in, in the log because if I crash, I want to make sure that my sequence is where I left off. So the reason why I, I think this is fascinating is because now if I do things like run this in a transaction, right? say I run insert into XXX, I should see now I have a 6. Right? I roll back. The tuple is gone, as expected, because I rolled back. But what should I get back for next val? Seven, right? So even though my transaction said roll back any changes, I sort of leaked a change outside my transaction because the sequence is maintained separately, right? And even though my transaction aborted, I still have to write a log record out to disk and say the sequence is now seven or six, right? So that if I come back, I want to make sure that I, I get the correct value. So this is why I find these things super fascinating because it's, they, they, they work completely different than other parts of the system. Right? Yes? Does this not violate the atomicity part of Asimir? Yeah, so he said, does, does this not violate the atomicity aspect of, of the guarantee of transactions as asset? Absolutely, right? So I can do this. I can do two, two transactions. Oh, I have two transactions, both in Postgres. Transaction starts here. Transaction starts here. So this guy is going to insert. Actually, we need to do, we need to do this. Select next val, right? Run the same query. What should I get? Well, as he said, I should get eight. Under again serializable theory, ser ser serializable theory, like it sh I should not see the effects of this other guy, but lo and hold, I get nine. This guy then ro rolls back, right, and it, it didn't roll back. So sequences are awesome. We had students implement this last class or, or last semester in, in the old system. Uh, we threw away, threw away all the code. We like to do this again, and I think I. I think there's a paper here. There's no good paper that describes actually how to do this efficiently, right? Okay. Uh, I, I realize I'm over time. Sorry. So we abandoned the hybrid storage model. I think the uh, delta version storage plus the column store is the right way to go, and that's what our current system does. Alignment matters a lot. You saw the performance differences. So you have to make sure everything's aligned. And uh, numerics are interesting. It, that might be another interesting project to look at it and make those efficiently. Catalogs are hard, catalogs are awesome. And making them transactional makes your life a lot easier. We'll see this in a much other basis. All right, I've rushed at the end. Any questions? Get a bounce to get the 40 ounce bottle. Get a grip, take a sip, and you'll be picking up models. Ain't it no puzzle, I guzzle, cause I'm more man. I'm down in the 40 and my shorty's got four cans. Stacks and six packs on the table. And I'm able to see St. Isles on the label. No shorts with the cloth, you know I got them. I take off the cap, but first I tap on the bottom. Throw about three in the freezer so I can kill it. Careful with the bottle, baby. Oops, don't spill it. Cause ain't eyes and said the pain eyes red. You drink it down with the guys, it'll rise head. Take back the pack of duds. They go get you some same knives and drink it to the suds. Billy D is the chili cheese, sit down with the weak guys. Be a man and get a can of St. Ives.